Right, welcome to lecture three. Um, as you might recall from lecture two, we were focusing on uh, characterizing fundamental particles. We covered uh, Einstein's theory of special relativity. We looked at the uh, conversion between energy and mass and E equals mc squared. Um, so we're going to go into a little bit more detail with that. Not, not so much more detail, but, but we're going to uh, find ways to use it that are going to be meaningful to us as nuclear engineers. Um, so we're going, to, we're going to look at the atomic nucleus with a fresh set of eyes. We're going to explore data for different isotopes and different nuclides. Um, there's resources online that we'll look over. Uh, and then we're going to explore something called a mass defect and uh, binding energy. Those two are very closely related. Uh, and then look at something that's also closely related to that binding energy called the separation energy. Um, but first, let's let's go back to our uh, diagram of the of the atom. So in the nucleus here, this is what uh, determines the nuclear properties. And these, the electron has a negative charge, positive charge for the proton, no charge for the neutron. Uh, these two together here are going to be called nucleons. In other words, how many nucleons I have is the sum of both my protons and my neutrons. The electrons, on the other hand, are going to largely determine the, uh, the chemical and electrical properties. And as I have, as I look at the uh, number of protons, that is going to uh, dictate the element that I have. The number of neutrons is going to dictate what's called the isotope. Um, and in in many cases, this also has reference to the stability, the stability of that isotope, the ability that it has to remain uh, with the composition that it has in terms of number of neutrons and protons. Uh, if it doesn't, that's it's unstable. That's called uh, being radioactive. Um, the number of nucleons then is just going to be Z plus A, or Z. All right, A equals Z plus N. And this is what's known as the atomic, atomic mass number, um, or sometimes it's just called mass number. And this is what we would look at on the periodic table. And this is, this is the nomenclature that you're going to see. This X here represents my element. Um, and so I would, I would have the number of nucleons up here for A. I'd have the number of protons here, and I'd have the number of neutrons there. But since these three are not mutually exclusive, are not completely independent of, of one another, a lot of times you'll just see something like this with the number of neutrons having been dropped. Uh, just because it's it's sort of redundant. And notice that here that that X in this uh, label here is my element, my chemical symbol. And so if I see something like this with U235, then that means that I am looking, I could also express this as U235 or just U-235. The fact that I have uranium, this is also sort of redundant to have the second call out of 92 protons. Well, if I have uranium, guess how many protons I have? I have 92. 
Now there's different isotopes of uranium. They all have 92 protons, but they have different number of neutrons. So different number of nucleons. So this is some additional shorthand uh, ways that you'll see this, but it basically just means I have uranium, 92 protons, with, in this case, 235 nucleons. Okay, so let's go to a quick example, uh, just to make sure this is this point is driven home. We'll fill out this table. We have different isotopes. So oxygen 20, aluminum 30, thorium 235, sulfur 36, uranium 238. And we want to know the number of neutrons and the number of protons. So what we'll do is we'll come here to a periodic table. This is on the Canvas webpage. You can take a look at it. You can consult any periodic table you get the same information uh, but these numbers up here are the basically the number of protons um, and so I have oxygen which is uh, has eight protons so I come back here I know that has eight aluminum has 13 uh, thorium has 90 sulfur has 16 and then uranium has 92 right here. And so the number of neutrons, since this here is the number of nucleons, it's just simply the balance of that. And so how many neutrons do I have here? I have to have whatever number it takes to get up to 20. So I've got 12 here, I've got uh, 13, 17 here, um, 90, 235, I've got 145, um, I've got 20 here, and I've got 146 neutrons. Okay, so it's, it's rather straightforward, simple problems to take any isotope and to be able to say, okay, this is, if that's my isotope, this is how many neutrons I have, this, this is how many protons I have. And it's important that we do this right, because if we don't, then everything we're going to do from here on out, calculating what's called the, the mass defect uh, or the binding energy, all of those are going to be incorrect if we don't get this right. Um, so, All right, let's go back to our lecture here. So we're going to start talking a little bit more about these nuclides. Um, a couple definitions for you here. Uh, when I have a nuclide that is just a unique atom or, or a nucleus arrangement, number of protons, number of neutrons, that sort of thing, and that is what defines it, my protons and neutrons. And in, in all of these, um, we, we, there was a, some text up above, I didn't really note it, but we assume that we have the same number of electrons and protons, that that's equal so that our charge is zero. If we don't have that, then uh, we've got what's called an ion. But for these, uh, the nuclides that we're going to consider, they, they will all have the same number of electrons and protons almost exclusively. So, a couple other definitions. Uh, so that's what that's what nuclide is, uh, and I'll just put number of electrons is same. So we have radio radio nuclides. That's one that is unstable. That is one that is going to undergo some radioactive decay. In other words, that combination of protons and neutrons is unstable. Uh, we have an isotope, which is generally when you're, when you're talking about an element, and then you say, what are its isotopes? And so I have some number of protons. I can't have any number of neutrons. There, there's only going to be a range over which I can actually form an element that, that, uh, that is either going to be radioactive and decay to something else or or actually remain stable. Um, so any isotope has the same Z, I have the same number of protons but I have a different number of neutrons. And a radioisotope is is just like it sounds, it's, it's just like a radionuclide, whatever a radionuclide is to a nuclide, that's what a radioisotope is to an isotope. And then we have isotones and then isobars. 
So isotope, isotones, isobars. Isotones have the same number of neutrons, but different protons. And isobars are those that have the same number of nucleons. And so the total number of, of neutrons and protons remains the same. And so what does that look like on this chart down here? This is, this is typically what you're going to see when you look at uh, these online sources, these, uh, the chart of nuclides. And we'll visit, we'll visit these four here in just a minute. Um, but this is what you're going to see is some, uh, some version of this where you've got the y-axis is my uh, number of protons and the x-axis is the number of neutrons. And what this plot here is showing, uh, these little squares are basically the uh, stable isotopes. The stable nuclides. And we've got this line here which represents um, an equal number of protons and neutrons. So where Z equals N. And what does um, let's look at let's look at an isotone here. Let's do isotone. An isotone has the same n but a different number of protons, and so this would be an isotone, basically a vertical line on this chart. An isotope. An isotope is going to be uh, a horizontal line. It's going to have the same number of protons, different number of neutrons. And then finally an isobar will have the same number of uh, nucleons and what that's going to look like is basically a, a, a diagonal line going from the top left down and so I'd have the same number if this was the iso bar then it would go from here to there and no matter where I am along that line I would have 40 nucleons total and I can create similar iso bars for any other number of nucleons that I want to. So that's the general um, that's the general chart that you're going to see, and then we can dive into individual. Um, we can dive into individual um, isotopes, and um, we can get all sorts of data from those. And, and much of the data that is available on on these resources is is going to be above and beyond this course. Um, we're going to get to a lot of it, uh, but we're definitely not going to get to all of it. Um, so let's visit a few of these. Let's start with the uh, National Nuclear Data Center. So you see here's your chart and there's a link right here for chart of nuclides. These are the different databases. Um, let's go in here to the chart though. Let's take a look at it. And so this is a live, not a live version, but a, but a, uh, but a movable slash um, I can zoom in a little bit, I can move it around, that sort of thing. And so, you know, the smaller atomic numbers are going to be down here. My protons, Z, so here's my hydrogens. And if I hover over any of these boxes, then I, 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 I'm told what the isotope is. So right now I'm, I'm over aluminum 30, and I can click on that, and I can get additional data over down here. Um, and so I see something called the mass excess. I see a half-life. I see its decay mode. Um, if I zoom in a little bit, we'll be able to see this a little bit better, probably. There. And so as I hover over this, um, so there's different argons. Anytime they're black, right now these are color-coded for half-life. And if I look over here at the menu, I can see what these color codes mean. So black means that I have a really, really long half-life. And in this case, this is an infinite half-life. Black is indicating that this is a stable isotope. It's not going to undergo any kind of radioactive decay. 
and you can see that under I'm hovering over uh, chlorine 37 right now and you can see that my half-life there is just listed as stable and so this if I have if I have chlorine 37 it's not going to to change to anything else this is going to remain chlorine 37 and so the chart that we were looking at in the notes the the, the plot had only these black squares basically those stable isotopes stable nucleides um, but I can hover over e any of these and I can see what their half-life is. I can see, we'll get into that in more detail th later on the semester. We'll get on, we'll get uh, into these decay modes uh, quite a bit throughout the semester as well. Um, but I wanted to, we'll go explore some of the other ones too. But this, this one is useful for, especially for visualization. Um, so if I, if I know what these each of these mean, then I just click on here and I can see <coughs> that I've got different types of <coughs> sorry different types of uh, decay depending on what side of that uh, stability line I'm on. So if I'm on on this side, I've got a certain type of decay, and on this side, I've got a different type of decay. Um, we'll start to explore this a little bit more. What the binding energy is. Um, but it's got all this all this data here, and so what what you're what you're probably familiar with at least right now. Let's let's go to a different uh, source here. Let's let's look at the NEA. Actually, this is this is this is different tools and databases. I want to draw your attention to this one in particular. Um, this is I so this is I'm. I'm doing this on a A&M owned machine and so I'm unable to install Java uh, but you are welcome to, this is free software, um, you're welcome to um, do a, you can use the online version which will feel similar to the others that we're going to look uh, but you can also just download this software and as long as you have Java installed on your on your computer you'll be able to make use of all the data that's there. Um, so let's look at the IAEA you come in here to the live chart of nuclides. Looks similar to what we had before. I can come up here, and I, I could have. Th there was a spot in in the one from um, uh, the. This is uh, Brookhaven, basically. There's a spot here where I could have um, just typed in my isotope as well, right here. Um, but here I could type in, and if I want to look at carbon. Uh, 12 then it zooms me right into carbon 12 and I can see all, a bunch of data here it starts listing um, well we're not familiar with any of these just yet but I've got by the end of today's lecture we'll know what these two mean uh, the separation energy for a neutron separation energy for a proton uh, binding energy binding er energy when you divide it by a that's binding energy per nucleon that's a measure of the stability of that <coughs> that uh, isotope, uh, and in this case, we've also got an atomic mass listed. This is in micro AMU, and so that's why it's this, such a big number. But carbon twelve, as you recall, that's that's what we use to define what AMU was in the first place, and so uh, the atomic mass of carbon twelve is twelve. Uh, mass excess. Uh, we're going to come back to this. Um, We'll, we'll look at the mass defect and, and then I'll, we'll, we'll come back to this and, and hopefully make some sense. With it, the, and it's got a few more pieces of information like the, the date it was discovered and that sort of thing. But I can come in here and I say, you know what, I, I'm more interested in carbon-14 and now it will uh, give me that data. And you see there's a bunch of tabs up here as well. Um, we will get into some of these tabs throughout the semester, but for now, um, just start exploring if, if nothing else the atomic mass trying to trying to make sense of that um, and I can do the same thing with this final one here this is the, uh, the Korean atomic energy um, this is the one that I typically use myself if I'm if I'm needing that sort of data it's just a simpler uh, kind of watered down uh, version of it I can do the same thing here type in carbon 12 and here, it, it, you know, the format's a little different, but it, it's all the same data. Uh, my atomic mass is going to be 12. My uh, 
binding energy per nucleon is listed here. Um, in this case, it also tells me the abundance of this. So carbon-12 is, you know, carbon in the atmosphere, not the it's not 100% carbon-12. There's also some carbon-13. So if I take that 98.93 and I add to that 1.07, now I'm now I'm at 100%. Uh, so that's what carbon naturally occurring carbon is. It's mostly carbon-12, but there's a there's a trace of carbon-13. And so I can I can look all these up if I go back to um, uh, there's there's cross section databases. Well, again, we'll get into that later in the semester. Um, but if I come back here, I forgot to mention one thing on this Brookhaven one that that I really enjoy is the fact that I can just download data, um, and the format of it is is just in the data that I want. Um, and so if I just I don't even need to select anything up here. I just go here to menu and I say give me a CSV file. I don't want all of these um, so I'll clear all of them and maybe I just want that binding energy. Um, let's see, does it have atomic mass here? I don't see atomic mass. Yeah, it has mass excess. But, um, Anyway, if I wanted to, to do this now, I can export this and it would be a CSV file full of all those nuclides there. And it's got, it's got one column, which is my uh, binding energy per nucleon. So I've got a column here with my protons, my neutrons. Uh, it gives me the name of this. Um, and then it tells me what my binding energy is. Um, so we need to be careful here. Uh, this is a little misleading. It says binding energy, but, but we asked it to output the binding energy per nucleon. And so if I take this and I multiply it by the sum of these two, I mean the, the, the sum of my neutrons and my neutrons and protons is the number of nucleons I have. So if I take this number here and for instance multiply it by six because I have six nucleons, then I will get the binding energy. But this this is uh, slightly misleading. This should be binding energy per nucleon. And we can go and double check that with carbon-12, which we were just looking at. We've got six protons. Carbon-12, there it is. So 7680 um, keV. And if I go back to the Korean chart that I had here, and I look at my binding energy per nucleon, then yes, I get 7.68 MeV, so that's, that's exactly what that represents. So that's a quick, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll go back and use these in, in other examples, um, but that's just a quick overview of, of four of the resources. They're all, they all use the identical underlying data sets. Um, and they will throughout everything we do this semester. And so find the one that, that you enjoy the user interface with the best. And, and just as a reminder, this, this one here um, is a bit of software. You can, you can use this online, um, either just HTML or, or Java-based, or you can download this and install this locally on your uh, personal computer. So let's go to a, a couple examples here. Um, for example 3.2, we want to list all of the uh, isotopes and isotones and isobars for boron 11. So we got to come back here and let's go to boron 11. And so my my isotopes is gonna it means the same z, so it's a, it's a it's a horizontal line here. So I can just look at this chart here and, and see that I have for boron, uh, my isotopes are all going to be boron because they have the same same Z. I basically have everything from uh, boron 6 all the way through boron 21. Those are my isotopes. Isotones are going to have the same 
n. And so that's going to be a vertical line. And so with boron 11, I start at, uh, I can either go from bottom to top or top to bottom, doesn't matter. I've got neon 16, I've got 15, I've got oxygen 14, nitrogen 13, carbon 12, and of course boron 11. Beryllium 10, lithium 9, helium 8, and then hydrogen 7. Those are my isotones, and then finally my isobars. This will be the same number of nucleons. So I take boron 11, and I'm going to do a diagonal line. Uh, from top left to the bottom right. And so I've got um, nitrogen 11, carbon 10, boron 11, beryllium, let's see. Oh, no, I messed up. Of course, yeah, it has to, everything has to be 11. Carbon 11, beryllium 11, my next one. They all have to have the same number of nucleons, so it's got to it's got to have the eleven lithium, and that's it. All right, so those are my those are my isobars for uh, boron eleven. So looking at the next example, we want to find out what the atomic mass of carbon is. And what we mean by that is the naturally occurring carbon. So we were talking about this a minute ago. We know we have carbon 12, and then we have carbon 13. So let's come back here to carbon 12. Um, it's going to be occurring 98.93% abundance. And carbon-13 is going to be, of course, we need to write down the AMU here. This would be 12 AMU. And then carbon-13 carbon is going to be 1.07% abundance. And the atomic mass for this one will be 13.00335. Let's do 5-5. Five, five. So in general, with any kind of AMU measurement, you want to include at least five decimal places, uh, but it's better, I find, to just include six um, because something as small as an electron, either including it or not including it, can make a very big difference. So we've got atomic mass of each of these two. And all we need to do is look at the, uh, we need to weight them by their respective values for abundance. And so my atomic mass for naturally occurring carbon is just going to be equal to 0 0.9893 times 12 AMU plus 0 0.0107 times 13.00335. Five AMU, and when you do that calculation, you find that it is twelve point zero one one AMU, and that is what it was for the uh, the periodic table. So going back to the periodic table, we go to carbon, and what we've learned about carbon carbon, if we're not as familiar with with what these numbers mean, we we might. Uh, have second guessed it and said, wait a minute, I thought carbon had a, an AMU of 12 and that's why that's how we defined it. Well, that's true for carbon 12. Um, but for naturally occurring carbon, this would be the, uh, the atomic mass. And it's the same thing for all of these. And so you need to, you need to realize that those numbers here in a typical periodic table represent the combination of whatever is naturally occurring whether it's uh, whether it's stable or not.
So uranium, for instance, is going to be a combination of U-235 and U-238, mostly. Okay, so going back to the lecture notes, um, we've explored this a, a bit, and now we'll be looking into um, what's called the mass defect or the binding energy. Um, this is, uh, we can illustrate this by looking at the different forces. We have an electrostatic force in the nucleus. Um, this is going to be like charges repel, so my, my protons want to move away from each other. I've got a bunch of positive charged particles all smashed together in a, in a tight space. Uh, that, that electrostatic force wants to push them apart. And so clearly there has to be something that's not just counteracting that, but counteracting it to a large extent. And that's what this strong nuclear force is. And that's the key, the key to holding the nucleus together. It's also called the binding energy. And so this is going to be uh, influential. It's going, to, it's going to act over very, very short distances um, because my length scale between two protons is, is really small, basically the diameter of a, of a proton. Um, and so it's very short distances over which it acts, uh, also called the binding energy. And we're going to spend some time now just talking about how we calculate that binding energy. And it's going to deal with uh, what we derived last time, or, or at least partially derived and talked about last time, was this mass-energy balance. The fact that mass is energy and energy is mass, and I can, I can make use of that. And so in a, in a typical... Um, engineering analysis of mass coming in and coming out and energy coming in and coming out you would treat those two independently you do a mass balance to find out the mass coming in or out and then you do an energy balance to find if you knew the work you find the heat or vice versa uh, but what what this Einstein's special theory of relativity teaches us is that um, mass and energy are should be considered together and so it's a mass energy balance and that's what we're talking about here in, in terms of this quantity e equals mc squared. And so I have my, my energy and the mass of the assembled nucleus and the assembled atom is going to equal the energy and the mass of the separated or disassembled. And so if I take some some uh, isotope and I and I pull apart everything I've got I'd lay down the the um, protons the neutrons the electrons and I look at their energy and their mass together and then I look at the assembled energy and mass together those two should be equal and so I have M my mass of this element X whatever it happens to be mc squared of that plus whatever energy I have. And so we're going to ignore kinetic energy. And so what we have here is that binding energy. That's the energy that's holding that nucleus together. And so that's going to have to equal all the energy and masses of these components that are now separated, separate, separate particles. And so this will be mc squared and j here is going to cycle through a proton, a neutron, and an electron. And so we have this binding energy that, that, that we want to calculate here. And we can, you start to see that it's just going to be related to the difference in my masses. And E equals mc squared should, if, if we really understand that, it shouldn't be surprising to find out that that when I have the masses of all the components laid out and I compare that to the mass of the assembled atom with all these same components, I get different values in terms of the AMU. And that mass, that's called the mass defect. And that mass defect 
uh, via this equation, E equals mc squared, can be converted into an energy, and that energy is my binding energy. And so this is the equation I'm going to use to, to do that. So this is the mass of the assembled Of the assembled nuclide and then J again is going to cycle through each of those and so if I look at my binding energy my binding energy is just going to be equal to that change in mass times C squared where this change in mass is called my mass defect and it's just going to be the number of the number of, so the neutrons times the mass of a neutron plus z which is my number of protons times the mass of the proton plus the mass of the electron that's all the components laid out uh, sufficiently far away from each other so that there's no more forces acting on them uh, this one here, we can't really, we should never neglect the electrons, even though we, we, it seems like they don't matter. If you neglect them, you can get, uh, depending on how many protons there are, you can get a very significant error. And so this, you'll see in the, in the textbook and in other uh, sources, this is going to be called MH, because it is, ma it is the mass of hydrogen with one proton and one electron, no neutrons, right? That's what hydrogen one is. And so it's basically the, the, the sum of the mass of a proton and the mass of an electron. And that's gonna be equal to 1.007825 AMU. Okay, so if I know the number of neutrons and I know the number of protons and I know the mass of a neutron, I know the mass of a of proton and electron together, it's, that's given right here. And I can look up on the chart of nuclides, I can look up the mass of that isotope of that nuclide and that's going to be this value here. Oh, I'm sorry. That's going to be, um, oh, I forgot to subtract. I need to subtract this. There needs to be another term here, mx. And this is what I'm going to look up, look up in the nuclide chart. Or if I have a, a, a table of, of that data, then, then I can just use that. Okay, so let's do an example on this. We've got we want to calculate the mass defect, the binding energy, and the binding energy per nucleon. And we'll talk about that, why that's important here in just a minute, but we want to calculate that for tritium. So what is tritium? Tritium is hydrogen 3. It's got one proton because it's hydrogen and it's got two neutrons um, and so what does this look like I've got a proton Let's try this a little bigger I don't have two protons I have two neutrons so that's my nucleus and then I've got one electron this is tritium and so I'm looking at the assembled version of this plus some binding energy and then I'm going to compare that to a completely disassembled version of those particles. And so here I've got Z equals, equals 1, N equals 2, and if I look up, let's go to this real quick. I type in H3 here, then I can write down the atomic mass, that's that first item there, 
And so my atomic mass here um, equals 3.016049. I've got six decimal places there, I think I'm good. And so my, my mass defect here, that's the first thing I want to calculate, my mass defect is going to be two, which I have two neutrons, multiplied by the mass of a neutron, which is 1.008665 AMU. Uh, plus one proton electron pair, 1.007825, minus this 3.016049 AMU. And so if I do that, that math, I find out that the, the mass defect is going to be 0 0.009106 AMU. And so you can see why we want to include more than just a few decimal places. You never, you never want to round off um, with AMU. You want to err on the side of, of more decimal places. So that's my mass defect. That's the first part. And the binding energy is just us needing to then convert that mass to an energy. And that is easily done with the e equals mc squared. And, and since we memorized this before, we know that the binding energy is just going to be equal to 931.5 MeV per AMU. That's what that, that's basically what C squared is, uh, multiplied by that delta M00906 AMU. And this is going to equal 8.48. 8.482 MeV. And the binding energy per nucleon is going to be 8.482 MeV divided by the number of nucleons I have here. I have two neutrons and one proton, so it's going to be divided by three, and that's going to be equal to 2.827 MeV per nucleon. So coming back to the table of nuclides here, um, this is where we got our atomic mass, as you see. Our binding energy is, is right where it needs to be. Our binding energy per nucleon uh, is right where we expect it to be in terms of MeV. That's MeV per nucleon. Um, but it has this other term called mass excess. And I, I want to draw your attention to this because this is a point of confusion if you're not familiar with this. We're talking about mass defect. This is mass excess. Uh, there's a certain way you could interpret that, that they'd be identical, but we're getting a different number. Obviously, we're getting 8.482, and this is 14.9498. Uh, this is going to come in handy when we are dealing with uh, nuclear reactions, where we've got a handful of products, a handful of reactants, and uh, we it would be nice to be able to normalize everything according to some some offset and then we could just use the number of nucleons uh, for instance and and the way that we do that is through this mass excess and the mass excess is just like AMU is a number that is defined in terms of how it relates to carbon 12 then the mass excess is also uh, related to the value in carbon 12. So if I come here and I type carbon 12, you'll see that the mass excess for carbon 12 is zero. And that definitely does not mean that the mass defect is zero. I have a mass defect because I have some binding energy. I have binding energy for every nuclei, nuclide. Um, so we'll visit this again uh, in the future, but just know that for now, just know that mass excess that you see in any of these resources, not just this uh, Korean table, um, are almost always going to be uh, with, with reference to carbon-12. 
and mass excess is not the same as mass defect. So let's talk a little bit about a little bit more about this binding energy per nucleon parameter. There's a there's a chart here in the notes um, that has that parameter there, the the binding energy per nucleon as a function of the total number of nucleons. And you see it starts low, it peaks somewhere over here, and then it, it slowly decreases after that. So what this means, somewhere over here where we have a high binding energy per nucleon, what that means is that, I, that my energy, it takes a lot of energy to disassemble that. That means it's stable, right? So a higher value of this means it's stable. And so somewhere around an atomic number of, of 50 or, or 60 is where we have that, that, that maximum. This data point right here is going to be helium. Two neutrons, two protons, uh, two electrons. Uh, that's very stable. It's hard to disassemble that. Um, but for all of these... Uh, in, for, for some of them that are stable, for some of them that are unstable, this is a different story, but um, that are severely unstable. Uh, but in general, if you would go past this, this uh, value, this peak here, you're going to get some lower values. And if you go the other side of it, you'll also get some lower values. Um, but what this, what this means is that um, if we have something that's very heavy, we have a high atomic number, then this is prime for fission. This is going to be a good spot here for fission. And the reason why is because if you start with a heavy, uh, heavy isotope, heavy nuclide, and, and you split it into two, then you can see that, you know, if, if, this, if this did have an atomic number, a total number of nucleons of 200, and I split it evenly, then I'm going to come down here to, to 100. And you can see that the binding energy per nucleon for those two daughter products, those two fission products, um, is going to be higher. My binding energy per nucleon is going to be higher than it was for the, the nuclide before it underwent fission. And so what that means is that... Um, there's some extra energy that got released, and that's that's what we want. And so, in general, this this stuff over here on this side is going to be where we we want heavier elements to break apart. We want to undergo fission there. It's the same story over here for the lighter elements. We want uh, we want to uh, fuse them together. This is prime for fusion. And so when we when we assemble them together, we have a uh, a higher binding energy per nucleon. The result is a more stable um, product. And and in order for that to happen, again, we're releasing. We have to release energy. And so for fission, for fission, what that means um, is that in order for this to be valuable to us, the, the binding energy of the fission products is going to be greater than the binding energy of whatever heavy isotope we started with. And because of that, we've got that extra energy that's, that's being released. Another way to say this is that the mass of the heavy isotope is going to be greater than the mass of the fission products because some of that mass got converted into energy and that's what we want from fission and for fusion in order for fusion to be valuable it's it's the exact opposite inequality we want the um, the binding energy of the reactants to be less than the binding energy of the product. Or in other words, we want the mass of the reactants to be greater than. So 
So both of these are going to result in moving, whether we undergo fission or we undergo fusion, both of them have the effect of moving towards a higher uh, binding energy per nucleon value. We're going towards that peak. So the, the, fis the fusion sends us this way and the fission sends us this way. We're, we're going towards that, uh, that peak to, to values that have higher B, B, E over A. And if we're doing that, that's, that's going to give us energy in both cases. So. Okay, um, last few topics that we'll talk about um, in today's lecture. One is the separation energies. This is in reference to just taking a single neutron or single proton away from that isotope. Um, and so it's going to require some energy to, to do that. I've got to, it's generally going to be a, a, a photon that's going to come in and because of its energy it's going to peel off one neutron or one proton. Um, but just like, just like we did in the, in the binding energy in the, mass, in the mass defect analysis, we know that the mass energy is going to be balanced here. And so if I have some element here with a number of neutrons and protons, um, if I'm going to peel off a neutron, then obviously my protons will stay the same. This will go, this will go down by one, and so will the uh, total number of nucleons. And then I've got some neutron out here. If I'm peeling off a proton, then I've got this same element and that's going the reaction is going to look like this it's going to become a new element now because i've changed the number of protons i still am decreasing my nucleons by one but but because i changed my protons i've got a different element so instead of x i've got y and i've got a proton and an electron on the other side and so this is what it looks like if i'm removing a neutron And this is what it looks like if I remove a proton. So what do those mass energy balances look like? Well, I've got the mass of the element with n neutrons times c squared plus this extra energy that I need to supply in order to peel that neutron off. That's my, that's my separation energy, that Sn is. Um, and then I've got the mass of my, my new isotope, basically, times c squared, plus the mass of the neutron times c squared. And so my separation energy in this case is just going to be c squared times that mass difference there. So m of my new isotope plus the mass of the neutron minus the mass of the original isotope. And likewise for the proton, I'll get mxc squared uh, plus that separation energy for the proton is going to be equal to the mass of y. That's my, that's my new element on the right hand side of that equation plus mh, and if you recall that mh uh, includes both the proton and the electron. That's the mass of hydrogen 1. Uh, and then i got to subtract mx. And so my separation energy for separating a proton out there is just going to be a difference in the masses again, but I just need to include the electron in that middle term and then I got to be aware that 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 is now a new element and so but in any, in any case I take the the product here I take and find its its mass right and in these cases these uh, this value here and this value here and this value here those four are going to be things that I get from uh, one of those sources a chart of nuclides 
um, regardless of which one I use, that, that I'm going to get the masses from there. Okay, we can do a quick example on this one. So we've got, uh, we want to calculate the neutron separation energy uh, for all the isotopes of carbon. So you see I've got my uh, my Z is 6 for all these cases and this is uh, rather than having me look it up individually and then type it in I just did that beforehand and here's the values so you notice carbon 12 I've got an AMU of 12 exactly and so what I want to do is take this take this data set and uh, calculate what my separation energy is going to be from getting rid of one neutron and so in this case I'm not going to have any data here but for carbon 9 if I want to separate a neutron then it becomes carbon 8 I can't take carbon 8 and, and take a neutron away from it because it doesn't result in anything going back to the chart of nuclides here I got carbon 8 all the way through carbon 23 right, and I can't start with carbon 8 and say how much energy do I need to supply to get a neutron to, to, be, to be separated because there is no carbon 7 and I can't, that, that's not something that can be uh, even sustained and so I'm going to start with carbon 9 and then consider these different scenarios all the way up to carbon 23 and then we're going to see what the results uh, relative magnitudes are and, and see if we can draw any conclusions from that so I'm going to copy and paste that table into Excel here. So again, I'm not going to be worried about this first one because I, I can't have carbon 7. But if I look at the expression in the notes for this, then I've got I've got my separation energy is going to be equal to C squared times that mass difference. And so I want to take the mass in units of AMU of my isotope that is one less neutron, so that's this one, and then I want to add to that the mass of a neutron, which I don't have, uh, I'll, I'll get that, but I'll put that right here, and then I'm going to subtract the, the, the mass in, in units of AMU of my current isotope, the one that I have that I'm trying to see how much energy I need to supply to get rid of one of the neutrons to separate it. So I've got to come up here for my neutron. My neutron is going to have a mass of 1.008665. Okay, so that's the, the mass difference here. And then in order to get my, uh, to convert this mass to an energy, I just multiply by 931. So there is my value in MeV, what it would take to go from carbon 9 to carbon 8 to peel off one neutron. It would take 14.25 MeV to do that. And then we can just, what we'll do is we'll put some dollar signs on this guy. And then I should just be able to copy it down. and then copy this down too. So there's a couple things here. Uh, first of all, we've got some negative numbers. Uh, that simply means that it is not going to be possible. Um, we're not going to be able su to sustain that. And we'll go back to the chart of nuclides here and, and look at carbon 21 and 23 in, in a little bit more detail. But uh, the other thing worth noting is that every other one is larger than its surrounding. So in other words, the, the isotopes that have an even number of nucleons have a higher separation energy requirement. And that's true for carbon-10 compared to carbon-9 or 11, and that's true for carbon-12 compared to 11 or 13. And for any one of these that have an even number of nucleons, that's true compared to its immediate surrounding 
uh, odd number of nucleon neighbors. And this, so what, what this means is that this is more stable. In other words, it takes a lot more energy if I have an even number of, uh, depending on what you mean by a lot, but it takes more energy if I have an even number of nucleons compared to if I have an odd number of nucleons. Um, and so it's, it, it speaks to the stability of my nucleus, especially for, in this example for carbon, if I, if I have an even number, then it's going to want to remain exactly how it's configured. In, in other words, I got to supply a lot, of, a lot more energy to change its configuration to get rid of a neutron. And you'd see the same thing if we did the proton separation energy. But those are the main two points that, that are worth noting here is that uh, even number of nucleons, uh, you generally get a higher uh, requirement for that separation energy. Um, and then I've got two here with negative values, which, which means it's, it's just not happening. It's not possible there. So if we look at the, um, go back to our chart here. And we look at this row of carbon. We were going all the way from carbon 8 up to carbon 23. Um, you see that 21 and 23 are grayed out. And what that means, I click on any of these carbons. And if I have, if I'm on one of the isotopes for carbon and I click on this, then I can see all the available isotopes. And you see that for 21 and 23, I just don't really have data. And so it's, it's, there's a question mark next to the K mode. Um, yes, I have, I have an atomic mass, and yes, I can calculate a binding energy per nucleon, um, but this is not something that is, that is generally, uh, it's got a half-life of less than 30 nanoseconds um, for 21, and for 23, it's got a half-life that's not even listed. And so we just don't have data for these, and so it's not surprising that this analysis that we just did gave us negative numbers for that separation energy requirement. Right. So um, you'll see some homework assignments on all these topics. Um, we will cover one more topic quickly here, and that's just talking about the general size. I, I think it's useful to, to look at uh, the size of our nucleus versus the size of our atom. Uh, the, the example here you see of, of a baseball field and a quarter the baseball diamond is analogous to the size of the atom and the quarter is analogous to the size of the nucleus and so that's how much of a size discrepancy we have between between those two it's it's, it's just enormous orders and orders of magnitude different um, and you can see here, here's an expression for, um, for radius of the nucleus. So this, that's what this is here. And it's, it's in general and, and, and very close to a nice smooth sphere. Um, that's, the, that's the general uh, surface finish if you, wanna, if you wanna think of it that way. Uh, very spherical, very smooth. And so um, here's a couple of, of uh, different nuclei here. You got hydrogen, boron, uranium, and it shows you the size difference between those two. But, but again, all of these are going to be really small compared to the, uh, the size of the uh, atom itself. So we'll go to our final example here. And we want to say we're we're going to take we're going to take an ocean liner or a, a uh, aircraft carrier. I forgot to note something here. Um, the density here. If I take the size of a um, of a neutron or proton, and I look at the density that I would get in this nucleus then my density is, is on the order of 2.3 times 10 to the 17th kilograms per meter cubed. Okay, so we're going to use this here in this final example problem. 
So we've got an aircraft carrier. This is the weight of that aircraft carrier. And we want to, to see this, this is more like an Ant-Man style uh, reduction. A uh, lot of wasted space in that atom. And we want to see if we took all the mass of an aircraft carrier, 100,000 100, tons, how big would the object be with the same mass if it was just made of nuclear components like protons and neutrons. And so in this case, it's not a sphere, we're looking for a cube, and we want to find that L. So my volume is going to be L cubed, and my density is going to be mass divided by volume. So volume is mass divided by density, and that L is just going to be V to the one-third. Cube root of, of my volume is going to be the length of one of the cube sides. And so I can calculate this. I take 10 to the fifth tons. And in one ton, I'm going to have 2,000 pounds mass. Um, and then I'm going to convert from pounds mass to kilogram. In one pound mass, I've got 0 0.4 five four kilograms and so I'm converting from tons to kilograms and then I'm going to divide that by this density here so that that would give me my mass if I just multiplied those out and so I divide by density which was uh, 2.3 times 10 to the 17th kilograms per meter cubed take the cube root of that and I find that I get 7.34 times 10 to the negative fourth meters. In other words, that cube would be less than three quarters of a millimeter on one side. So you got three quarters of a millimeter, three quarters of a millimeter, three quarters of a millimeter, and if this was comprised of nothing but protons and neutrons, then I could fit as much mass as there is in a hundred ton uh, aircraft carrier in that small space. So, um, not that we can do that. Uh, it's just uh, it's it's mind-boggling to me to to think of how dense that 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 nucleus is by itself. And this is you'll have an example in the in the homework too to kind of look at this. But um, it's amazing how much how much mass uh, is is just compacted in such a small small space. All right, well, that concludes this lecture, and we'll see you soon for lecture number four.